Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of Startups for the Rest of Us. I'm your host, Rob Walling. Every single Tuesday morning for more than 10 years, we've shown up and we've shipped an episode, and it's about building ambitious startups. These days, we focus on bootstrapped and mostly bootstrapped SaaS, but it's always been about founders and developers and designers and people who want to start companies but don't want to jump on the venture train, but they still want to build amazing businesses. And they want to do things that are not only interesting for them, but be in control of their own destiny. They want to ship something into the world that people use. They want to have freedom to work on what they want. They want to have the purpose of working on interesting problems. And they also want to maintain happy and healthy relationships. That's what Startups for the Rest of Us is about. And that's what we'll continue to focus on. Even as, as things change, as the landscape has changed so much. Back, again, 10, 11 years ago, we were talking about info products. We were talking about iPhone apps. We were talking about one-time downloadable software and SaaS was part of that too. And back in the day, it was all about bootstrapping because it was such this binary difference of being in control and giving it all away to venture capitalists with their crazy terms. But things shift over time and we look at problems from different angles and we take the, the best information that we have and we make smart decisions from that. And this show has many different formats. Sometimes there's a conversation between myself and a founder or a subject matter experts. We have startup news roundtable episodes where we cover news related to bootstrapped and mostly bootstrapped founders. We have Q&A episodes. We have breaking news episodes, all kinds of stuff. And this week, I'm flying solo on a Q&A episode, which is something I do every once in a while. We have a great backlog of listener questions. And so it should be fun to run through a few today. My first question is from Joe. It's, should I switch to a C-Corp to take advantage of QSBS in five years? He says, hi, Rob, longtime listener, first-time caller. Thank you for all you do for the Mostly Bootstrap founder community, of which I've been a quiet participant for many years. My question is around QSBS and for the listener that's qualified small business stock. I've been fortunate enough to have had a couple asset sales of my former SaaS businesses. I'm working on a new SaaS business now that I think I can grow and sell in five years. I've been operating under an LLC for all of my apps, and I'm considering switching to a C-Corp to take advantage of QSBS to save on taxes if I'm able to sell it in five years. Do you advise the companies you invest in to switch to C-Corps for this very reason? Thanks, Joe. This is a complicated topic, to be honest. I know I don't advise anyone to switch to a C corp for you know for a specific reason because there are so many trade offs with C corps and LLCs. And Anar Volset and I actually recorded an entire episode of Startups for the Rest of Us focused on this question and the trade offs of the two paths. And if you want to check that out, it's episode four forty two: Corporate Structures and How the Choice You Make Now Can Impact You Years down the line. So QSBS, for those who don't know, is Qualified Small Business Stock. And I'm now reading from Investopedia. So I'm not a lawyer, not legal advice, but Investopedia talks about how any stock in a small business that is acquired after August 10th of 1993, the capital gains from that can be zero from federal taxes, not from state taxes. This is US only, obviously, can be zero if and there's a bunch of things. The investor must not be a corporation. The investor, meaning you, right, the founder, the investor must have acquired the stock at its original issue and not on the secondary market. So you have to get it when the company starts. Investor must have purchased a stock with cash or property or accepted as payment for a service, must have held it for five years, at least 80% of the company's assets must be used in the operation, blah, blah, blah. And, and there's a limit. I don't remember what the limit of the company size is, but it's high and I'm going to say it's something like $50 million in annual revenue. And if you get above that, then you're no longer small business. It's, it's something to that effect. So zero cap gains, right? Imagine building a SaaS app and selling it for $10 million and playing zero federal cap gains on that. And in fact, Josh Pigford, who was on this show just a few episodes ago talking about how we sold bare metrics, he qualified for this. And he only paid state tax because he lives in Alabama and they have a, a tax that wasn't exempt from. So is it worth switching to a C-Corp? If you plan to run it for five years and sell it, personally, that's not a bad idea. If you plan to pull dividends out, it's not a good idea because C-Corps have double taxation, right? Where whatever income you make, the company pays income tax on it. And then if you were to draw a dividend, you pay an additional dividend tax on it. Currently, that rate is 15% or it's 18%. If you pull out, I don't know if your income's above a lot, like half a million or a million a year. So it really comes down to that. There, there's no right or wrong answer here. And most bootstrap startups 
are LLCs, sometimes S-Corps, and that's because they're pass-through entities and you can have the money flow out to you and it goes straight to your person. You know, you don't have to pay double taxation, but there are many companies that I see and many companies that I've invested in. In fact, the vast majority of companies that I've invested in are C-Corps. That's both my personal angel investments and tiny C companies. But there are absolutely some, you know, a portion, it's definitely a minority portion who remain LLCs such that they can run a long-term profitable business that they draw out dividends as their payout and they, and they really don't plan to sell it. So I think that's probably how I would think about it. Hope that helps, Joe. Thanks for the question. My next question is from someone who asked to remain anonymous. He says, do you have any advice on what sort of offers or arrangements can work for attracting entrepreneurial employees when offering equity doesn't make sense? For context, we're a team of seven now doing north of $5 million a year before payroll, and there are a few people in my network I'd love to convince to join the team who have been trying to get their own ideas off the ground for a few years while filling the gaps with contracting and stuff, but never really making it. These sorts of folks would be a huge value to the team because they think like entrepreneurs and have the right values, but I don't think they'd ever want to settle for just a regular old salary job without some other factors to scratch their entrepreneurial itch, even if they haven't been able to reach escape velocity with their own stuff. Offering equity feels tough because we're not based in the U.S. and our staff is all over the world and we don't have any ambitions of building a big team or trying to exit. We're just super profitable and pay out tons of dividends to ourselves. I also kind of feel like giving people some tiny percentage of the company over three to four years still doesn't really scratch the entrepreneurial itch. Nobody I know with a tiny equity stake in their company seems to actually act like it's their company or take meaningful responsibility for the company's success. Any thoughts on what we could offer people who have dreams of running their own thing that would be attractive and feel like a good opportunity that's still somehow aligned with their goals instead of feeling like it's delaying their own ability to try and make their own thing work? We've thought about profit sharing, four-day work weeks instead of five, so more time for side projects, but do you have any other ideas? The answer might well be nothing, which I'm prepared to accept. Thanks, and hope things are awesome for you. It's a good question, and I actually know the, the asker and I know of his business. And it makes sense. I don't think they're going to sell the company long term. I, I do think they're going to run it and run it highly profitable and have built an amazing, amazing company. And, and frankly, my hat's off and, and congratulations on, you know, on, on all your success. I do have some thoughts on this, and I think some of the options you named, if properly engineered, could, could work. But honestly, my first thought is, are you sure that you want to hire people that really just want to do their own thing. There's a difference between hiring entrepreneurial minded employees who maybe think like entrepreneurs a bit, but they don't actually plan to strike out and you can hire them and they will stick around as long as they're doing interesting work and they're paid well and, you know, and they like who they work with and they'll stick around for years at a company, especially an interesting startup like this, a small team where they can have a big impact. But on the flip side, there are those truly entrepreneur minded people who the whole time they're just thinking, I want to do my own thing. I want to do my own thing. I want to do my own thing. And if you realize that kind of no matter what you do, those folks will go out on their own at some point. And, you know, a good example is Derek Reimer, right? Derek, when he and I met, he was, I think he was 21 or 22 years old and he was hacking on these amazing little SaaS apps that he was building. And he won a couple local startup competitions. That's where we met. I was one of the judges of these competitions. And when he and I started working together, he was a contractor on Hittail. And then he was a contract, he was part-time. Then he was a part-time contractor on Drip. And then he was a full-time contractor on drip and then he was a w2 employee on drip and then at a certain point we started talking he was like yeah i'm gonna go do my own thing because really i want to found something i want to own something you know and, and if you know derek today you know that he's a gifted and talented entrepreneur and he always wanted to go out and build his own thing and so you know that was at the point where he and i decided okay if we move forward you know at the way we're going without you having equity in the company because truly i mean i had bootstrapped and done all these lifestyle businesses and i saw drip as as the next phase of that just a, a maybe a more ambitious version of that but i hadn't honestly given a ton of thought to giving out equity. It just wasn't really, you know, in, in the game plan. And I think for a lot of the reasons that this question asker is mentioning is that I, I just didn't know that it made sense. But 
in the end, you know, Derek and I did land at obviously in, you know, an equity split and he took the, that title of co-founder since he had been, you know, around since the early days. But I always knew if we didn't sell Drip at a certain point that Derek was going to transition out, you know, and he was going to do something that where he owned, you know, owned the whole company in essence. And, and that was fine, right? That was the understanding. And so I think back to the, to the question is like, do you want to hire those people knowing that you, the clock will be ticking almost no matter what you do, unless you give them ridiculous amounts of, of equity that I don't think you want to do until someone has, I, I don't know, 10% equity. It depends on the person, but until someone has 10% equity, they don't really feel like an owner. To your point of giving someone half a percent or 1%, it doesn't tend to mean that much. And so I think that's the first thing I think about is even if someone's skills and their attitude are a perfect fit for your company, if truly what they want to do is their own thing and you think you'll have them for a year or two years, Think about whether that's what you want to do. Or do you have these friends who have that attitude, but you do think that with the right motivations, they could stick around for years and years, assuming you plan to run your company for years and years. So that's the first step. I would, I would give that some thought. Second thought is I like the idea much more than equity since you're not going to be selling, you're not looking for a liquidity event. I would really think about profit sharing and I would think since a company is so profitable, obviously seven employees doing millions of dollars, there's, I'm guessing, millions of dollars in net profit being thrown off. So that's where I would think about hefty profit sharing. And I would also, there's an interesting thing of, do you know what their motivations are? Aside from I want to be an entrepreneur, like the ones who might stick around for the longer term, if they made like a solid base salary for where they live and then had the opportunity to really make a big chunk of money through profit sharing and feel perhaps, you know, again, on a team of seven or eight people, you can feel like you have ownership. And especially with profit sharing, not only are you thinking grow the top line, but you can also think about, are there ways we can potentially save money, you know, for being a little extravagant with things? There's like this ownership of both the top line and the, and the bottom line, because that profit turns into money in my pocket. So if I were going to do any of those options, you know, there's, there's profit sharing, there's bonuses, there's equity. And I actually covered this in a solo episode, episode 519, profit sharing, stock options and equity. And I talked about bonuses there too. So if you want to hear my general thoughts on when I would use which, that episode is where I would go. And then I guess the other thing to think about is if someone could bring so much value that you do think even if they worked with us for a year and they were only three days a week or four days a week, they would still bring more value than anyone else I could find. And I don't know that that assumption is actually correct, but, but maybe that is. Then that's what I would be thinking. I'd probably start a conversation with a couple of these folks and try to figure out, is it individual motivations that some people just, some people would be happy to make buckets of money, like an egregious amount of money. Because you do have a luxury to be in that base camp situation where, you know, base camp only has 55 employees because they've grown so slow over so many years. And they have so much net profit coming off that they pay all of their people, no matter where they live, it's like 90th percentile of a San Francisco salary for the role. And they have that luxury. Most people can't. You have that luxury too, in theory. Again, I don't know all, all your numbers, but you have the luxury to do things that are outside the conventional wisdom because your company is so profitable and you're looking for these high achievers. And so my guess is if we took four of your friends, there might be one or two of them who would stick around for an extended period of time if they literally made twice as much you know, in salary and had a great job where they contributed and worked with you and worked with the rest of your team, they might stick around for, for several years and maybe could put their side project thoughts and, and ambitions into your company. I know that at certain points I did that. I was always working on side projects and then I'd get into a really interesting contract or a really interesting job and I would turn it off for a while because that creative itch was being scratched. I was working with really cool people and that allowed me to turn it off in the short term. And then, you know, are the other two maybe motivated by working fewer hours a week and making a full-time salary or working fewer hours a week and just working on interesting projects with you? I think that that's the big thing is, do I think this is possible? Yes. I almost feel like it potentially not a blanket approach and that it might depend on the individual. And with, obviously without knowing the individuals, it's, it's hard to know. But I'd be curious if you, you know, brought this up with one or two of them independently and just started the conversation, how that might pan out. So those are my thoughts. I hope that was helpful. 
My next question is from Anonymous Hacker Man. I'm getting a lot of anonymous questions today, and you'll, you'll see why this one, this subject line is actually anonymity. He says, hey, I have a question regarding anonymity. I'm currently at a large S&P 20 company. Wow. And would love to begin indie hacking, but I feel like I'm at a disadvantage as I can't exactly hack with the garage door open, as I'm assuming it would not go down well with my current employer. Do you see any way out of working around this? So first, not a lawyer, standard disclaimer. First thing I would do is I would definitely look at my employment agreement and any IP agreements I've signed and figure out legally, do they think or could they make a claim to own everything you do, even if it's on your personal computer and on your personal time? And there are certain states where that's allowed and there's certain states where it's not. And even in those states, some employers still have you sign things that maybe would be inadmissible in court, but you'd have to fight it in court and on and on. But I would at least in my head know, have I signed anything that essentially commits everything I own to them so that I know if that's at least on the table? Then if I had the means or I had an attorney that I knew or had worked with, or I could maybe go to Google, I would try to figure out, you know, does my state enforce that? And is it the state where you live or the state where the company's headquartered? I don't know, not a lawyer, but I would try to do some research, whether that involved paying an attorney or whether that involved just using using the interwebs to try to figure out, do I have a case if I were to try to, to go against this? I'm not saying you would ever want to fight this in court. Frankly, if anything, it would probably be settled out of court as most of these things are. But at least then you have the information, right? And this is the first process is 30 minutes of reading through your docs. And then the second process is a few hours, either a conversation or some research to just get yourself educated on legally what is it. Then there's this whole other idea of it not going down well with your current employer. Because whether they own stuff or not, if the culture frowns upon you doing side projects or you doing any kind of side work, then that's a whole other issue, right? It's not necessarily a legal issue, but it is an issue that could cost you a promotion, it could cost you a raise, or it could cause them to to let you go. Because there's obviously a big difference between them having a legal case against you, which is a real problem, right? It's, It's... Something that will come up in due diligence if you ever sell. It will come up if you ever decide to raise funding or it can come up and it's a problem. So personally, it's your risk tolerance. Personally, I would not mess if I had signed something that said that someone else owned all my stuff, even done on my own computer, in my own free time, I would not indie hack. I would then think to myself, I have three options. I can not work on side projects. I can find a different job or I can risk it. And of course, I wouldn't risk it if I had signed something, but you know that would have to be your choice. It comes down to a personal risk tolerance. If I had not signed anything that said that they owned all the stuff that I've done, and in fact, I will say that the last salary job that I had, this is right as, this is 15 years ago, say, that was right as IP agreements were becoming a thing, especially with developers. I signed all the HR paperwork, and when I came to the IP agreement, I looked at it, and I don't even remember if it said they owned everything or they owned everything. I don't remember what it said. I just remember thinking, I don't want to sign this, and I never signed it, and no one ever said anything. I guess HR maybe didn't have their act together enough to... um, to realize that I hadn't signed it because I needed to know, I knew I was going to be working on stuff on the side and I needed to know that there couldn't be a case in essence brought against me or a, a claim or a threat or whatever it was. And so if you haven't signed anything, then you have the choice of being secretive about it and trying to be anonymous online as much as you can be and still launching things. And Again, this is your choice. You have to assess the risk tolerance because if you get caught, quote unquote, doing this, then potentially you could, again, lose your job, not get a promotion, whatever. I'll tell you in my personal experience, I just did it on the sly, on the side. And I built I built some tools and launched them. I acquired .NET invoice. I'm trying to think if I still work there, if I was contracting. it. I honestly don't remember the series of events, but I was definitely hacking on things on the side and, and working on, I had my blog and then I also had software side projects that were generating at the time, not a ton of income, but I was definitely coming home nights and weekends and working on them. So that's real. I mean, there's, there's no insight. This is such a, a, I think a personal decision. And I think a big part of it is getting educated so that you know what you're actually dealing with and that you're comfortable with the risks you're taking. So I hope that was helpful. Anonymous Hacker Man. And the last question for the day is from Pramod. And he says, do you think 
the disruptive innovation idea by Clayton Christensen can help find a niche. Disruptive innovation is the idea that former Harvard professor Clayton Christensen came up with where a product is targeted at the lower end of a market and which is ignored by the big players. A new company can target this market segment by creating a product that leverages new technology, which may not be mature enough for the higher end market. For example, Google Docs versus Microsoft Word. Do you think disruptive innovation can be applied by bootstrappers to find a niche? I, I mean, I think this is the play of every bootstrapper, to be honest. Not necessarily the disruptive innovation where you need a technology, because your disruptive innovation as a bootstrapper is you move extremely fast, you're extremely capital efficient, and you only need $10,000 a month to quit your job, and you probably only need, I don't know, I'll throw out 50000 a month or 100000 a month to completely change your life. You know, you hit seven figures of ARR and you can feasibly, if you're SaaS app, feasibly sell that company for whatever, four to six, seven, eight million, depending on how fast you're growing. That's it. I mean, if, if you truly are a bootstrap or mostly bootstrap founder and you want to change your life, you don't need to own a massive market like a venture backed unicorn land grab startup. And so those are your advantages. The way you're disruptive is, is what I just outlined. You don't need all the things that such a large company needs. Leveraging a new technology is fine too, but then that introduces product risk, right? There's three types of risk when you're launching a new product. There's product, there's market risk, and there's essentially it's marketing slash execution. So product risk is can we build this? And if you're using a new technology, the answer might be, no, like building Google Maps at the time, and I think Google Docs was, it took a lot of work because it was, it was the, the Ajax technology they called it back then, right? But it's just having web apps in the browser that are, that are super uh, interactive and don't need to refresh every time you submit anything. There was a lot of risk there. Now, there wasn't a ton of risk for Google because they had a bunch of really smart engineers and, and billions of dollars, but for an individual trying to build those, it introduces product risk. Most SaaS apps have almost zero product risk, and that's why you'll hear me say, don't go build the product because there's no risk there. The risk usually is in the market or in the execution. And what I mean by market risk is, does anyone care? Will anyone buy it? Will you build something that people want? Is there a market for this thing? Can you find product market fit? Does it even exist for the product that you're inventing? And usually the more novel you go and the more new and the more innovative with those ideas, the harder it is to find that. And the more you kind of stay in the lane of an existing category, like electronic signature apps, like email service providers and marketing automation providers, like online scheduling apps, things that everyone uses, you need to put your own spin on it. You either need a proprietary uh, you know, marketing channel that you own, or you need to have enough differentiation in your positioning and your feature set that a certain subset really want it. But staying in those existing categories helps reduce that market risk. And then again, there was product risk, market risk, and marketing or execution risk is can you implement? You know, Can you drive leads? Because you can build a great product and there can be a great market for it. But if you don't know anything about marketing or sales, building a product and expecting people to find you is just not going to happen, right? I mean, and that's the probably the most common mistake that I see with early founders is especially developers and designers who think that the product is everything where in fact it's like 25% of the things and, and really all the other things, the marketing and making sure you, you hit the market right is the rest of the equation. So to summarize, I don't necessarily think you need disruptive innovation per se, but I do love the idea of entering larger markets at a probably a lower price point in a niche that's ignored by bigger players. And I'm going to be honest, like if this truly is your first time launching a SaaS app, then of course I would say go back to the stair step approach, you know, play high school baseball and then go up to college and then play minor leagues, major leagues before you really get to the big time. And that would be the stair step where I would try to build a smaller add-on with one-time sales. You can hear me talk about stair step approach on many other podcasts because Entering these larger markets is awesome, but if you don't have the experience or you don't have some funding or you don't have some, just some prior knowledge of how to do these things, there's so many things that have to fall into place in order to build a SaaS app, in order to launch it, in order to market it, that it's it's quite hard to do that. And it, it does, I think, for a first-time founder, often requires an exceptional amount of luck or an exceptional amount of, of hard work and skill. And I I tend to want to do things and recommend people do things that are repeatable and that don't need exceptional. They don't need to be outliers in order to succeed. And that's what I see with, with the stair-step approach is that 
you can put one foot in front of the other and you can execute and you pick a small niche, you get it to five or 10K a month and that's amazing. Maybe that one app gets there or maybe you have to cobble a few together. Then you buy out your own time and now you have all the experience of having supported customers, having learned which features to build, learned how to market, learned how to do some innovation, learned how to manage product, learned how to manage developers and potentially support people in VAs. And you don't have to tackle that all at once if you try to launch that app, that you know, a SaaS app into a large market right at the start when you're still pretty green on all these fronts. So thanks for the question, Pramod. No one's ever sent that question in before. And I actually think it's an interesting mental model for thinking about bootstrapping SaaS. That's going to wrap us up for the day. Thanks again for joining me this week. I have a favor to ask. If you haven't tweeted or LinkedIn, is that the right, is that the right verb? If you haven't posted to Twitter or LinkedIn about startups for the rest of us, or just told a friend that you get value out of it, I'd appreciate it. We're at Startups Pod on Twitter. And if you feel like these episodes help keep you motivated, if they're entertaining, if they're tactical or strategic or what have you, I'd really appreciate a shout out. And of course, at Startups Pod, at Rob Walling on Twitter. Thank you for listening. And I'll be back again in your earbuds next Tuesday morning.